Ray Mayaki es el director de la NEPAD, que es una organización de cooperación de África, de cooperación y coordinación entre gobiernos africanos. Muchísimas gracias por la entrevista con Claxo TV. Thank you for the interview for Claxo TV. And Africa is an opportunity, is a risk from outside or for inside? Thank you for inviting me. To answer your question, I would first start with a historical contextualization. Mm -hmm. you know, in Africa has been uh, marginalized for quite a long time yes. uh, since the independences and evidently before. Uh, what has happened in the last uh, 10 years is a sustained transformation process which is reflected by three main characteristics. Uh, the first one is sound improvements in macroeconomic governance, mm -hmm. which makes uh, Martin Lagarde say, for example, that most of the public finances of African countries are better managed than European countries with the problems of Europe that we... During the crisis, the exactly. last crisis, the and even crisis. After, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. okay. The second characteristic is that there has been a very strong reduction of the dependence to aid. ODA is falling quite importantly, and the domestic resources in the continent have been multiplied by five, in the last 12 years. The third characteristic is global political governance. Uh, the number of countries that can be assimilated to functional democracies has improved significantly. So out of the 54 African countries, you have 10 countries, roughly, yeah. that have uh, strong political issues, but you have more than 30, 40 that have developed uh, a stabilized political system. So if you take these three characteristics together, the main uh, uh, paradigm change that you observe mm -hmm. is a, a confidence that the Africans have in themselves that they didn't have 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, poverty, for example? Uh, poverty, if you look at the MDGs, Millennium Development yes. Goals, and the levels of attainment of these objectives, you will see a disparity in terms of uh, impact. Uh, in what refers to education and health, these indicators have progressed quite well. But in what refers to food security, you can see that Africa is still very fragile. Even if we have a high potential in order to produce the necessary food uh, to feed uh, one billion inhabitants, we still face uh, uh, important challenges in terms of food security, which means that the poverty rates globally have diminished, but uh, poverty is still a massive challenge on the continent. When you say massive, you are speaking about the which figures? In terms of uh, total volume of uh, poor people and vulnerable people, if you look at uh, uh, the figures of 2000 and 2012, you can see that roughly we have about 450 million people out of 1 billion that can be considered with living with less than one dollar a day. Mm -hmm. And this is not acceptable. Now, the other figure is that you have a growing middle class. Let's say roughly 30% of Africans today live in a middle class. But what is important also to highlight is that we are the most unequal continent in the world. The levels of inequality and uh, the Gini coefficient of Africa is really the worst in the world. 
So uh, whatever we do in our public policies, we need to take that into account and tackle that issue of social inequality. In which way? Because uh, take it in account and uh, solve it and fix it is very difficult in general. It's difficult in Europe, it's very difficult in Latin American countries, which will be the key point in Africa for, that, for a fall in that, yeah, be, focusing be, it. Uh, absolutely. In terms of public policy design, it is a complex issue. Mm -hmm. And that complex issue is reinforced by one single factor, which is the demographics of the continent. Uh, Africa is a unique demographic situation in the history of demographics. We have not finalized our demographic transition. Our demographic growth rates are still between 2.8 and 3.2 and 75% of Africans are under 24, which means that the median age in Africa is about 19, while in Europe it's 47. Mm -hmm. So uh, reducing, reducing social, yeah, it can be good if it becomes a demographic dividend uh -huh. with the right policies. Ah, okay. But it can be catastrophic if it is not managed properly and uh, the creation of jobs for the youth, which is an immense proportion of the population, is the best way to fight social inequality. So how can we do that? How? By mainstreaming youth issues in all policies, uh, health policies, transport policies, energy policies, must be geared towards creation of jobs for the youth. Second issue, we must go through an agricultural revolution. Why? Uh, the majority of that youth still lives in rural areas. Even if we have a, a significant urbanization process, those who live in rural areas will be the majority for the next 30 years. And their main activity is agriculture. So if we want to uh, take uh, advantage of that potential, we need to invest significantly in agricultural development, which means diversification of the economy in rural areas, which means empowering small-scale farmers, which means at the end of the day, a specific role of the state in terms of rural empowerment and rural transformation. How to finance it? Well. If we look at uh, the public finances of the continent today, uh, the deficits are very low. Uh, inflation is very low globally because, as you know, in the 90s, we went through strong macroeconomic uh, adjustment through the structural adjustment programs. And that has allowed the tax basis uh, to be quite significant. And that has allowed to multiply the domestic resources. Now, on a continent of one billion inhabitants, one billion, you have less than 60, 60 million Africans living in countries where aid is more important than public finances in public investments. So, the uh, importance of resources mobilization, domestic, mm -hmm. has been extremely important. Now, the issue is that in the policy design, the role of the state has to be reviewed so that we do not think essentially in terms of top-down processes, but a combination of top-down and bottom-up. What does it mean uh, governance-wise? It means that uh, central planners in uh, central ministries should not have a monopoly of designing policies. The role of uh, local communities, the role of a civil society organization has to be enhanced in the public policy design process so that we make sure that the interests of the majority are taken into account. Mr. Mayaki, uh, can we maybe we'll go on in a few minutes? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ciao, volvemos con Ibrahim Mayaki del Nepat.
Continuamos con Ibrahim Mayaki de NEPAD, el organismo de coordinación de cooperación africana. Mr. Mayaki, when you talk about Africa, you talk about Africa in general, the north, the south, over the Sahara, under the Sahara, and which are the differences in the kind of development and in the kind of uh, political challenges? Your question is, is very good because generally in uh, the news streams uh, there is a tendency uh, to look at Africa as an homogeneous mm -hmm. continent. And uh, as you know, there are much more differences between uh, an inhabitant of Kenya and an inhabitant of Senegal mm -hmm. than between an inhabitant of Spain and one of Denmark. So we, even if there is a, an important uh, common cultural foundation, the differences are quite important. Uh, cultural differences, economic differences, and political differences. Uh, first of all, that separation between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa is a false separation because it does not take into account the important uh, exchanges that took place between Egypt, uh, Sudan, and uh, uh, Uganda, and Algeria, Niger, and Nigeria. And if you look secondly at the levels of intra-African migration, you will see that many Senegalese are in South Africa, many Kenyans are in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So uh, at, when we talk about one homogeneous Africa, it does not always reflect uh, uh, a, a reality that can be analyzed with objective criteria. Politically now, uh, as you know, Africans have been trying to accelerate their integration politically, and they have framed the African Union, which is their main yes. instrument in order to accelerate integration. That integration process does take into account the sub-regional differences. So the founding blocks of the continental integration process is based on the role of the sub-regional uh, communities, um, which are mainly geared by economic objectives. In Southern Africa, you have SADC. In East Africa, you have the East African community. In West Africa, you have the economic community for West Africa. So integration is a two-way process. Uh, a continental framework on the one hand, but most importantly, a significant role for the sub-regional communities with an economic uh, objective. Why an economic objective? Because we want to build within these sub-regional units, regional markets, where we, where we will have a learning curve in terms of competitiveness. If we um, reach that capacity to be competitive in sub-regional units, it will help Africa as a whole insert itself better within the global economy. In which level would you classify the actual relationship between Africa and Latin American countries? I think it has evolved uh, quite significantly in the last uh, 20 years uh, for three main uh, reasons. Uh, first of all, the Latin America as Africa was mainly looking at Europe and the United States in terms of uh, global geopolitical relationships. But uh, we, all of us, found out through the several crises through which uh, globalization went, mm -hmm. that we needed to take into account 
our comparative advantages. Uh, South America as emerging economies, which do play a significant role in the global scene, and Africa is starting to become an emerging continent. So looking at these comparative advantages, uh, we are uh, quite uh, sure that by fostering South-South cooperation, we can uh, best take advantage of globalization. Globalization has not been tender to uh, South America and Africa. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, our interests were not always maximized because they were generally uh, dominated by other interests. So by affirming our uh, identities, and identity is just a word, by affirming uh, the conscience of our interest, we can be able to shape strategies through a stronger South-South cooperation in order really uh, uh, to push what we are aiming at. And what are we aiming at? We are aiming at a world that would be more secure, uh, that would be uh, more food secure, uh, that would allow our uh, populations to uh, be in stable countries. So I, I, I think the, uh, the fact of taking into account a, a new reality has pushed the political leaderships to think differently. Without uh, uh, any ideological uh, uh, penchant, it's uh, uh, mainly uh, pragmatism. And uh, pragmatism is uh, how can we best have a trade between ourselves that can benefit uh, better our populations? How can we uh, defend uh, interests in uh, negotiations that have to do with a seat at the Security Council? that has to do with the impact of climate change, that has to do with uh, Doha processes, uh, which is, which has now uh, uh, finished under a Bali light agreement, which is not favorable to anybody. But uh, 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 the main issue is how can we uh, get together in order to promote our interest in the international forums and strengthen our South-South cooperation. Mr. Mayaki, several years ago, uh, China entered into uh, Africa with investments, with people. Which is your balance now about the uh, uh, Chinese presence in Africa? The kind of presence, the kinds of uh, problems, the advantages and disadvantages? No. The, the, the relationship between China and Africa has known two periods. The first period was the Romantic period, you know, just after the, during the Maoist period and afterwards, mm -hmm. there was that Romanticism about uh, common goals in terms of liberation process, uh, the support to the independencies. Uh, that first period is gone. It was an important, important part of our history, but it is gone. But the second period, is a more pragmatic period. Uh, how can we uh, have an economic cooperation with China that can benefit both China and Africa? We know that China has energy challenges. Uh, at the rate of China's development, it needs a lot of energy. Africa has huge potentials in energy. So China is interested by Africa's energy potential. But uh, when we say that we can liaise adequately with China, it does not mean at any cost. It has to take into account Africa's interest. So this is why in that pragmatism period, we tend to be very careful not to continue exporting raw materials, but looking also at the necessity within Africa to create the necessary value addition. So now 
in the coming years, whatever contractual arrangements we get into with China, it will have to take into account the necessary industrialization of the African continent. So the romantic period is gone. We are in a more pragmatic period. Mr. Mayaki, thank you very much. Thanks to you. Ibrahim Mayaki, director del NEMPAD, Agencia de Cooperación Africana en Claxo TV.